There is no denying that the shadow of the atom bomb has been across all our lives. Sauce. It is good to see you. Here, let me just take this off real quick. Ah, I gotta protect yourself from the UV rays, you know. I'm uh, I'm I'm Jake. Remember, we were together in Kuchi Survival Fallout. Ah, you know what? Not a big deal. I'll put a link down in the description. <laughs> Here I am talking like YouTube, let alone the internet, is still a thing. But at least we survived the fallout, so we could live in this. You know what's happening out there, right? Well, don't worry, I'll, I'll fill you in. You know, they say that war is hell. But that doesn't mean the aftermath is any better. I need a can opener. Do you have a can opener? Let's get a can opener. Now we know the effects of nuclear fallout, but let's consider something which won't be difficult given our current situation. There is a relatively small nuclear war between two large countries. A hundred nukes are dropped. Less than 1% of the current global supply. 20 million people are instantly dead. Boom, gone. And that sounds like a lot, but in the grand scheme of things, 20 million deaths or 20 mega deaths is only 0.3% of Earth's population. But something worse happens and it isn't the bombs, it isn't the fallout. It's what's left for the over 99% of the population that survives, what we're currently experiencing nuclear winter. Nuclear winter is a fairly recent term, having been coined about 34 years ago. In the early 1980s, a team of scientists were assembled. Turco, Toon, Ackerman, Pollock, and Sagan. Together they wrote the scientific paper, Global Atmospheric Consequences of Nuclear War, and they discovered that nuclear war might be devastating but the shadow it casts is much larger, much more suffocating. Imagine entire cities in flames, hundreds of thousands of buildings, factories, parks, and forests burning. All that smoke is heated by the sun, lofted into the upper stratosphere, and the particles would blanket the earth. I'd love to give you some uplifting fact, a ray of sunshine, but unfortunately, all the soot would block out the majority of the sunlight, making it overcast everywhere for a very long time. And that is just the start. Obviously, for their research, they had to use climate models because to test it in real life, they would have to create an actual nuclear winter. We know how well that turned out. But they did find events in our past that helped them determine what would happen in our future and one of those events happened 140 million miles away. In 1971, the US Mariner 9 spacecraft, the first vehicle to orbit another planet, arrived at Mars to find it completely covered in a global dust storm. What scientists discovered was the dust had been brought high into the atmosphere, absorbing the sunlight and preventing a lot of it from hitting the surface. This brought the surface temperature down tens of degrees. But that was far away on a completely different planet. So it's hard to picture temperatures dropping so drastically here because of something as small as dust blocking out the sunlight. But we don't have to imagine, nor did researchers, because it's happened before here, over 200 years ago. The Tambora volcano erupted in 1815 in Indonesia. That eruption blotted out the sun and produced global cooling of about half a degree Celsius for a year. Half a degree seems pretty insignificant, but it isn't. 1816 was called the year without a summer, or 1800 and froze to death. In New England, frosts happened every month killing the crops, and this was during the summer. The price of grain shot up, and with that, farmers tried selling all of their livestock since they could no longer feed them. 
In Europe, the stock market collapsed and widespread famine occurred. So, using that information, they were able to conclude what would happen. But that study was done at the height of the Cold War, when a full-on global nuclear war was much more of a threat. Remember when I asked you to consider an attack with 100 nukes? Well, that's a lot more likely and a lot more relevant to what we're currently dealing with. So, in 2009, researchers, using the original paper as a framework, estimated the effects of an attack with 100 nukes the size of Hiroshima's. Even at that relatively small scale, the attack was globally devastating. And it all starts with tiny particles. At least five teragrams, about 11 billion pounds of smoke, would be produced because of the fires started by the bombs. Within two days, those tiny particles would rise seven and a half miles into our troposphere. The sun would heat them up and they would continue to rise. After 49 days, the smoke would reach a height of 31 miles and fill the stratosphere. By this point, the soot would cover the majority of the planet, blocking sunlight and making the skies overcast. Unfortunately, precipitation doesn't reach the stratosphere, so the particles wouldn't be washed away. And speaking of precipitation, there would be a 10% decrease of it worldwide due to the lack of sun, which would cause problems with evaporation and the natural water cycle. Taking what we learned from Mars and from the Tambora volcano, the sunlight being blocked would drop global temperatures by one and a quarter degrees Celsius. The cold and lack of sunlight would obviously be bad for agriculture, with crops and farm animals dying off. But something else would also be devastating to that. Ultraviolet radiation. Even though the surface of the Earth would be colder, the black smoke in the stratosphere would absorb the sunlight, heating it up by more than 50 degrees Celsius. Because of that, nitrogen oxides would be lofted further up, destroying our ozone. Over 17 months, we'd go from this to this. Not only is UV radiation incredibly damaging to plants, it's also incredibly damaging to us. I'm not wearing all these layers and covering my skin just for fun. If I were to go outside unprotected, it would take just six minutes to be horribly sunburned due to exposure, which is why I need a can opener. Well, I mean, I don't need a can opener for the sunburns. I need it because there are no crops. There's no fresh foods, only cans. There's enough grain stored on this planet to feed the population for two months. After that, a billion people could starve to death. One billion. That's 13% of the entire population, 13% of everyone alive, that would just be gone. This reminds me of a line from T.S. Eliot's The Hollow Man. This is the way the world ends. Not with a bang, but a whimper. In 10 years, the clouds will clear. The soot will fall down finally from above, and the temperatures will begin to rise. And what will be left of us? You could say that the world had ended. You could say that we've given up hope. Or you could say something else. Where we stand is not destroyed. We are not in ruins, but in something waiting to be built, waiting to begin again. From these ashes, we can rise and create beauty. The crumbling walls are not a representation of our failures, but a reminder of the lessons we have learned. So we continue on, not because we want to, but because we have to. In the words of Carl Sagan, a new consciousness is developing, which sees the Earth as a single organism, and recognizes that an organism at war with itself is doomed. One of the great revelations of the age of space exploration is the image of the Earth finite and lonely. We are one planet, and, as always, thanks for watching. Thank you.